critical word. And I have spent hours in fear and in trembling before the Lord, and I have shed many tears, and I do not say what I'm about to say lightly or flippantly. I also ask that you honor the 48-hour rule. That after you hear what I'm about to say, you wait 48 hours from emailing Carl. (laughs) And before you send him a nasty email, just drop in what you think, I ask you to pray about it. Because oftentimes the first The first response to truth is actually offense. And certainly there are ways I'm trying to hone in my craft as a communicator, and I humbly admit I don't hear accurately all the time from the Spirit. I'm a human that makes errors. So certainly feedback, constructive feedback, holding each other accountable, I love it. I'm game. First, wait 48 hours and see, is there anything offensive, not because pastor said this thing, but because it rubbed my flesh the wrong way. And actually, this tension is an invitation from the Holy Spirit to lean in through faith on him. Seriously, Carl's on staff now, then there's a reason why. Um, I'm a pastor, not a political commentator. My job is to teach you the scriptures and point you to Jesus, not to keep track of your voting patterns. As long as you're here, you do not need to tell me whether you voted or not or who you voted for. You don't report to me. You report to the Holy Spirit. But I felt like I needed to say two things this morning, and the first is cast your vote, and the second is keep it kingdom. And number one, cast your vote. Now, if you hold to more of an Anabaptist Mennonite conviction to refrain from all voting, I just want you to know I honor you, and I am not trying to override the Holy Spirit's conviction on your life. Glad you're here. Love you. But for those of you who maybe find yourself in a different category because you are unsure whether or not you should vote because you're a Christian— I'll 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 be speaking to you for the next few minutes. I would encourage you to do so. Even in the midst of some of the gaslighting that's happening and the narratives we're hearing. Right? Narratives like, there needs to be separation from church and state. There needs to be separation of church and state. So keep your religion out of politics. Have you guys heard that? But here's the thing. And I do ask that you humbly receive what I'm about to say. Here's the thing. The original intent of separating church and state was so the same person who's president of the government cannot also be the pope of the church. It wasn't to cut the values and principles and presence of the church out of the government. It was to protect the church from the government if the government was ever to overreach. That's what separation is about. Now, Jesus said in Matthew 13, 33, the kingdom of heaven is like the yeast a woman used in making bread. Even though she only put a little yeast and three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. Y'all, as citizens of God's kingdom, we are called to be a heavenly, redemptive presence that permeates all spheres of life on earth. And this can also include the political sphere. In fact, John Adams once said that sinful passions, unbridled by morality and religion, would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. Secondly, there's a narrative that says Christians shouldn't vote because we shouldn't be grasping for political power. Now, if our motive is to grasp for political power because we believe that it is only through political power that the reign of God is ushered in, 
In the words of the theologian Ice Cube, I always say, Chickity, check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> because shotgun bullets are bad for your health. Sorry. <laughs> I had a past. Jesus is redeeming me, okay? <laughs> it is not through and only through political power that the reign and rule of Christ Jesus can be experienced. Remember that it is the weak that will shame the strong. It is the meek that will inherit the earth. It is the peacemakers who will be called the children of God. It is those who follow in the humble, sacrificial footsteps of Jesus that will be exalted in glory beside him. After all, Jesus displayed his authority not by grasping for power or by keeping his life, but by willingly laying his life down for his enemies. That is true authority, my friends. But on the flip side, I do think that we as Christians can vote for someone to have political authority, not with the motive of power grasping, but with the motive of stewardship. Because having political authority is not wrong in and of itself. It's how you steward political authority that matters. Just think of Moses, who is Egyptian, Egyptian royalty and eventually the national voice of Israel. Or Joseph, who is elevated to second in command in Egypt. Or Daniel, who held a high political office in Babylon. Or Esther a Jewish woman who became queen of Persia, or Nehemiah, who was a cupbearer for King Artaxerxes before he became governor of Judea. These God-fearing biblical figures led with integrity and stewarded wisely the political authority they had, and the people prospered because of it. Likewise, we can do our small part and being proactive so we can hopefully see the best possible candidates and places of authority for the good of others. As the proverb goes, when the righteous thrive, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. Which brings us to the next narrative that goes, well, both candidates are pretty immoral and ungodly, which means my vote will condone their immorality and ungodliness, so it's best if I don't vote. But my friends, I just want to remind you that a vote is not a valentine. It doesn't mean you're crushing on them. It doesn't mean that you condone everything they've ever done. Personally, I really struggle with former President Trump. And I also really struggle with Vice President Harris. But voting as a Christian is just one of many ways that we can live out our calling to be the salt of the earth. Because do you know what salt does? Salt is a preservative that slows decay. So when voting, we should not ask ourselves, is there a candidate that embodies the way of Jesus and perfectly represents all of my Christian values? Like, no. We should ask instead, which candidate's policies are most likely to slow societal decay? Again, we aren't necessarily voting for a person. We're voting for a platform that best preserves as much as it can imperfectly righteousness in the land. Here's another narrative. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Have mercy. Here's another narrative. The gospel is either left nor right. It's neither left nor right, so there's no point in voting as a Christian. And to that I say, amen. The gospel is neither left nor right because Jesus, I know it's crazy. He isn't a Democrat. And he's not a, or a Republican. Jesus is the one and only begotten son of the father and he is the anointed and exalted king of heaven and earth and his kingdom is not from this world. 
but his kingdom is for this world. Because what does King Jesus desire and even teach us to pray? That God's kingdom come and God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And not just that God's kingdom will come and his will be done in the lives of individual souls, but in the life of whole societies and nations and countries. So between the two major parties in our country, we should do our homework and vote for the candidate who supports more policies that come the closest to representing the values of God's kingdom while also humbly knowing that both parties do not and cannot fully and accurately represent in wholeness God's coming kingdom, because both parties are still deeply flawed and far from perfect. But I have to add this, and the grip of conviction won't let me go. Wherever God's kingdom is present through the lives of individuals or through the life of whole communities, there will always be, until Jesus comes back, demonic opposition. And demonic opposition can come in all shapes and sizes, and it can come at us from all sorts of angles, one of which being human policies. And this is what concerns me about the Democratic Party in particular. Now, I'm not saying that every single policy or person who votes blue is evil, but what I am saying is that from the left, somewhere from within it, there are specific and extreme policies that actually carry hidden demonic agendas with the aim of destroying the image of God that dwells inside every man, woman, and child. There's the unlimited murder of the unborn masked as a human right. There's the redefinition of marriage, the cultural permeation of transgender ideology in the attempt to indoctrinate children with this ideology through school curriculum. There's biological men and women's sports, bathrooms, and locker rooms. There's legal protection for sex change surgeries for minors not to mention the threat of eliminating religious liberty, removing free speech, and taking away the rights of the parents who fail to affirm their child's transgender identity. And please hear me, to address these things, I actually don't think I'm becoming political or that us as a church, that we're becoming political. It means that politics are becoming more theological. I mean, when the government started to move past things like building roads and issuing out driver's licenses to the mutilation of bodies, the distortion of marriage, the annihilation of babies in the womb, and the sexualization of our children, the church didn't become more political. Politics became more theological. And more than just theologies to refute, these are demonic agendas to resist. As the Apostle Paul says in Romans 12, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Y'all, 30 million Christians did not vote in last year's presidential election. And I'm not saying that as a slam. I'm saying that as a statistic. And if you are led by the Spirit to be proactive in this one sense, while all the meanwhile being proactive for God's heavenly kingdom and all the other senses imagined, then go ahead and cast your vote. And I actually think that it's worthwhile because 30 million Christians did not vote last presidential election, and that election was decided by 42,000. So brothers and sisters, if you feel led, I would encourage you, yeah, go ahead, cast your vote, but brothers and sisters, keep it kingdom. We have to keep a heavenly kingdom perspective. Remember your first love. We are first and foremost citizens of an eternal kingdom with a far greater king. And hear me, if politics starts to become our religion, 
If candidates begin to feel like saviors, if campaigning feels like evangelism, rallies feel like worship services, and if elections feel like salvation and damnation, I think we have potentially traded God's kingdom for man's kingdom. Y'all, whoever occupies the White House in D.C. is actually far less important than the one who sits on the throne in heaven. Yes, we should vote. Yes, we should proactively push back the darkness around us as best we can and use the power and the spirit, uh, the, the power and the wisdom provided to us in the spirit for sure. But we also have to remember that the power of the gospel and the advancement of the kingdom is not ultimately dependent upon who is president of the United States. That's how powerful the gospel is, and that's how strong the kingdom is. This is why we can read passages like Psalm 146. It says, do not put your trust in princes. We can put our trust in the prince of peace, the king of kings, because his gospel will go forth. And believe it or not, throughout the course of church history, the places where the Christian faith spreads the fastest and the furthest are in the nations where Christians are persecuted the most, not where there's the most religious freedom. Think all the way back to the first century in the days of Jesus and the apostles. God's kingdom broke into our time and space. And God's kingdom continued to advance all during the reign of Augustus, Tiberius, and Nero, who literally found it entertainment to stick Christians through spears and to light them on fire. All of these men fundamentally opposed the kingdom of God and sought to destroy the movement of the church. And yet it did not thwart the purposes of God. And the reason, the reason for this paradoxical reality is because underneath all of the political problems of our government is the spiritual problem of the human heart. And my friends, political solutions, as great as they are, will not and cannot solve spiritual problems. So if you want to see political reform, we must first experience a spiritual revival, not the other way around. We don't seek political reform so that there can be a spiritual revival. No, no, no. We cannot think for a second that if only we get this person or that person in office, then the reign and rule of Jesus will be experienced. But if God has the heart, he has the neighborhood. If God has the heart, he has the workplace. If God has the heart, he has our county. If God has the heart, he'll have our country. So more than a political election, we need to be a people who are fervently praying for a spiritual revival. Again, we should do our part to see God-fearing people in places of leadership for the preservation of righteousness in the land. But whether we have godless people in places of authority or God-fearing people in places of authority, the plan and purposes of God cannot be stopped. The church will stand. The gates of hell will fall. Knees will bow and tongues will confess. And God will be exalted by the nations one way or another. So with this reminder, we should vote responsibly for sure. But we need to also live respectfully. We should speak out against evil, against the evil of our day, but we should never turn our mission field into our enemy. We should 
name the evil in our day. We should never turn our mission field, those that we are after, for redemption's sake, into our enemy. Because our enemy is not a candidate. Our enemy is not a political party. Our enemy is not a rainbow bumper sticker neighbor. Our enemy is the devil and his demons. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This means that we can and should identify, expose, and oppose the demonic agendas that hide behind the mask of human policy. But we are never to hate on and to speak curses over those very same politicians. And every single day, the Lord gently reminds me of that instruction that we get from Scripture after I drop off Jamie and Briar at IRE and I have to turn north on Hannigan because there's an accident every three weeks, and I go down the loop in 10 Mile, and I come down Metcalf, and there's this giant, giant flag that says, F. Biden. And every day that I drive past that flag, I pray for President Biden. I pray for his salvation. I pray for God's favor. I pray for transformation. I pray for him. First Timothy 2, 1 through 4, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. We will not be a church that openly curses those in office. Remember when I mentioned earlier that we must hate what is evil and cling to what is good? And I said that in the context of demonic agendas hiding behind human policy. Will talking with hate and condemnation toward others, even those in office, is also evil? Which means we also must resist that as well. So if you were amening me earlier in this word, you should also be the same people amening me now. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You are Christ's body upon the globe. How are you representing him? How are you embodying his love? How are you giving your utmost allegiance to his kingship? I see this sign that's been floating around says Jesus 2024. I think I know what they mean, but I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> because it's been Jesus for 2,000 years. And it'll be King Jesus for the next 2,000 years. And it'll be King Jesus for the next 2,000 years after that. And it'll be King Jesus for the rest of eternity. Church, on November 5th, Jesus will be king. And when we wake up on November 6th, Jesus will still be king. And his kingdom is eternal, unshakable, unstoppable, and indestructible. No enemy, no weaponry, no policy, no persecution, no opposition, and no election will change who Jesus is and what he's done and what he's doing and what he will do. 
our resurrected Jesus enthroned in heaven, as Psalm 2 says, laughs and scoffs at the kings of the earth. Because he has already been installed in the great oval office of the cosmos. He already owns all peoples and places. He already owns all countries and nations. He is the alpha and the omega. He is the first and the last. He's the author and the finisher. He's the lamb that was slain in the line of Judah who reigns. That's who Jesus is. Worship team, come up here. I implore you to surrender yourself in humble submission to the true sovereign of the United States of America and the true sovereign of the world, the Lord Jesus of Nazareth, whom at the mere mention of his name, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Lord. So no matter who gets in the office, no matter the poll results on November 5th, here's what we're going to do, church. Here at Laurel on Friday, November 8th, starting at 6.30, we will host a hearth night. We will host a worship night that no matter the results of our country, we get to come together and worship the king of the countries, the king above all kings, the only one who is worthy of our praise. Amen. Unlike Israel, we're not going to ask can we have a king or another king? Can you kill this king and give us that king? Like what God said to Israel of old, he's going to remind the church today, I already am your king. Yeah. Romans 12, 1 through 2. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, come on up. to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. If you are physically able, can you stand with me? Jesus, you are the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the ruler above all rulers. We go to you. We are clothed by your righteous and royal and intercessory robes. God, we ask you, Father, that your kingdom continues to come and your will continues to be done on earth, in America, and in all the other countries as it is in heaven. We ask for redemption. We ask for a spiritual revival. We ask that you grab the hearts of those in leadership, the hearts of those in office. We pray for them. We pray blessing upon them. We pray for their salvation. We pray for their life transformation. We pray that they bow the knee before you, Jesus, not because on the day of judgment they will need to, but on the day where it is their choice, it is their willing choice that they acknowledge you as king. We pray all of this, and we give you our devotion, we give you our allegiance, we give you our adoration, we give you our worship, and we pray our prayers all to you and in your name, Jesus. And the church says, Amen. 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 Die, poor 
church we love you and in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit may you go in his power and in his presence and in his in his peace 
And you, may you be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. We love you. Go be the church. Amen. Amen.